right, all right. Hey, was that amazing, just worshiping the Lord together, exalting him, lifting him up? It was just such a great time. I'm encouraged. I think I can face the week ahead. I think I can face it. Be reminded of how much God loves you. Uh, I want to say hi to everybody online. We know we've got lots of folks. Maybe you're out and about. I hope you'll stay in touch, those of you in the room, those of you uh, online. Stay in touch throughout the summer. We're walking through this uh, First Timothy throughout the entire summer, as you can see there, the paradox of living in the kingdom of God. So everybody at home, grab your Bible. And all of you, I hope you brought your Bible as well. We know we show you the scriptures often, but uh, grab your Bible. We're going to be in 1 Timothy, so you can start getting there. I'm going to set this up a little bit. I want to ask the question, don't you see, don't you think that our culture is like way overly obsessed with all things youthful? Now think about this for a minute. I mean, all things, all things young. Like, I get it, too. Like, all these babies up here, I mean, it's like, this is the best, right? We just love all things new, and, and yet, yet we, we, we obsess over being younger as adults. And I was with our students this week. If you're with children, especially, they just want to grow up. They just want to get, but at some point, you're just like, I wish I was young. And we go to great lengths, like crazy stuff. To try to stay young. We are obsessed with all things youthful, young, hip, coolest, latest, greatest. Got to have, you know, got to have like ripped abs. Got to look fresh. Got to stay young. Some people go to great, great lengths, right? Some people have surgery in order to look younger. Like we're obsessed with it. I was reading an article this week um, about the uh, Silicon Valley execs who are on the leading edge of the stay forever young movement that's going on right now. Dave Asprey is the, the guy behind the whole Bulletproof wellness empire. As some of y'all do, the Bulletproof coffee and, and whatnot. I'm not, not shaming you. Um, repent! No, I'm not. I'm just, I mean, it's, it's good stuff. It's all about being healthy and all that kind of stuff. It's amazing. Now, Dave says that he thinks we could live to be 180 years old. Anybody, anybody up for that? <laughs> anybody want that? Ask somebody who's like 90. Like, no, I, uh-uh, I'm out. Um, but he says, no, it could happen. He claims even that, w- that when he's 100, when we're 100, people at his age, that we could do things uh, that normally we do now in our day, like when we're 40. Like imagine that, running a 10K, you're 100 years old. I mean, we see that every now and then. It's like, a, it's like that's nuts, right? That somebody is able to do that or, or down, you know, downhill skiing at 100 years old. He said, no, no, this is, if we, if we play our cards right, if you <laughs> buy my products, if you, if, you have, if you have a certain diet, right, if you really take care of yourself, if you really go at it, you can stay forever young. Of course, this is not anything new, is it? This is the old fountain of youth. Now we're just seeking to find it in a bottle or creams in a jar or essential oils or whatever happens, you know, that just keeps you alive, keep you going, keep you young. Everybody is obsessed with it. And yet the Bible is very clear that, that we, all that we want to do to avoid the, the unavoidable, the undeniable, we're all getting older. Somebody give me an Amen. We're just getting older, and how about this? We're all going to die. Welcome to church. (laughs) We're all going to die. And I say this because it's crazy. Like I recently did a funeral. I was speaking to our students this week, and and I I shared with them uh, Hebrews 9.27. It says that that we're all destined, every person is destined to live, no, to die once. Okay, so that throws some other religious theological garbage out the window. We die once, and then we face judgment. That's it. And that judgment is primarily focused on what you have done with Jesus Christ. Have you received the grace of God, or did you determine you're going to make it on your own, you're going to be good enough somehow to appease the holy God, if you even believe in him? So the Bible says that we're all destined to die, and... All that matters one second after you die is what you did with Jesus. What matters a thousand years after you've died is what you've done with Jesus. So the question we need to be asking is this. As believers, our obsession is not about staying young. This might be the most cultural, countercultural sermon I'm going to preach all summer long. Instead of focusing on how can I stay young, the question we should be asking is how can I grow old? 
How can I grow in maturity and be obsessed with becoming more and more like Jesus? That's the focus. And so as a church family, we focus on those who are, yes, we honor those who are old. Those who've been walking with Jesus. And we're going like, not that I want to be like the, you know, the latest, hippest, coolest teenager we got in our church. I want to be like that person. I want to be like that 90-year-old who's been walking with Jesus all their life. And they look more like Jesus than anybody I know. We want to honor them, right? And so on a day where we dedicate babies and all the young families, which is awesome, we're reminded of the beauty of the local church. And today I want to talk about the beauty of our church in particular. And I, I'm kind of biased. I mean, I love our church family. But if you're a guest, you're going to hear a lot about just the kind of church we want to be. And, uh, and let me just let me continue to tease this out a little bit, because this denial of death and aging is killing us as a culture. Robert Harrison, he's a literary scholar at Stanford University. He wrote a book called Juvenescence. Okay, hang with me. Subtitle, A Cultural History of Our Age. He uses the term juvenescence uh, as if two meanings. One, in a positive way, it's a rejuvenation, a cultural rejuvenation. But then he used it in a negative way, what he calls the juvenilization of culture. That's actually a biological term. So he runs with, with um, literature and history and, and biological science, and he identifies these cultural forces that have helped us in our society become what he calls the youngest society on earth ever in history. He says this, for the first time in human history, the young have become a model of emulation, okay, in terms of fashion, ideas, perspectives, all the above, for the older population rather than the other way around. Now, this is so common. It's the, it's the air we breathe. It's the, it's the water we swim in. We're kind of going, yeah, isn't that right? Isn't it? Like, yeah, we all like, love the, the young people. We want to dress young and got to look young, got to stay young. It's so ingrained. But Harrison says this, the world that we live in is astonishing, astonishingly youthful and in many respects infantile. And think about how this has played out for us. For, for children, okay, for young people, even, even those of you in your 20s, it, it puts an undue pressure on everybody who's young. You know, and, and we put it on ourselves. We get our, we get our platform. Like we get our social media platform. Got to have a brand, you know, whatever. But, but the whole world is kind of watching. And parents do this. We idolize our kids to a point where we're like, they've got to be great. They've got to do something to justify my existence and my parenting greatness, right? We put all kinds of pressure on our young people for being the center of the world. And then on the other side, for those of us who are older, untold pressures of trying to stay young. And I think this especially shames our women simply for growing older, which is a beautiful and wonderful thing. We've got to rethink this, gang. And as a church, we can and we do. This is the paradox of living in the kingdom. We, in a society that refuses to grow up, we're saying, no, 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 no. I want to grow up. I am going to be obsessed with the beauty, not of youth. I'm obsessed with the beauty of Jesus and of maturity in him. That's the trajectory of my life. So today I want you to ask the question, how can I grow old? Well, Ben Rector, who's one of my favorite artists, he wrote a song about five, six years ago. And uh, he, he writes this. Please let me make something beautiful. A thing that reminds us there's good in the world. A thing that reminds us there's something worth fighting for. And he says, let it be wonderful. Let it be beautiful. I love that. And that should be the cry of our hearts as Jesus people. Lord, let us make something beautiful here. And and, and could it be that the beauty of the local church is how the world is going to see what it looks like to live like Jesus? I mean, think about it. We don't have a cultural ideal for old age. We don't have a cultural ideal for middle age. And yet, Jesus gives us a picture of what this could look like. German-American psychoanalyst, some of y'all know of Eric Erickson, he said, our civilization does not honor really, really honor or harbor a concept of the whole life. And yet here at our church, we do. 
We, we often talk about we're the church, we're a church for the whole family. We see the world differently. We honor those who are older. We honor the widow. We care for the widower. We honor those who are older because they have grown to show us what it looks like to pursue Jesus, be faithful to him. And his faithfulness has transformed their hearts. Young people, listen. Let us honor those who are older in our lives. We're going to talk about that today. What if the kingdom of God lived out in the church really shows a different kind of beauty that the world is not looking for? And what if God could give us eyes to see? And could it be that we would say together as a church family, Lord, please let us make something beautiful as we pursue you together. So we're going to do that today. First Timothy chapter five, okay? First Timothy five, we're going to look at verses one through 16. Here's the cool thing about, um, about following a, a book along the way uh, is that topics come up and, and sermons are established that maybe we wouldn't have put on a series of messages if it were simply topical. Today, we're going to focus in on how to care, specifically how to care for widows. And, and, and it's going to apply to all of, of, of us here. And by the way, again, before we get there, I've told you chapter five, um, to, to pursue the widow, to care for those who are isolated and alone, to, to seek after the, the oppressed, the, the orphan, those who don't have family, is to be right in the center of what God's all about. I've thought about this a lot recently. I'm always asking the question, how would God measure our success as a church? Is it the number of people who come? And clearly it's about making disciples. Is it the number of you know, the, how, how great our music is, um, how great, you know, our, our programs are. I mean, all those things are important. But when we look at scripture and throughout the Old Testament into the new, God says, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what true devotion to me looks like. It's caring for the oppressed. It's caring for the widow. It's longing for and going after the orphan and those who have no families. And it's caring for those who are in prison. It's helping people get back on their feet. It's caring for those who cannot care for themselves or do anything for you. No law of reciprocity. This is grace, isn't it? And he calls it out in the Old Testament and throughout the New Testament. In fact, uh, for Psalm 68, verse 4, you can see it on the screen there. It says, Father of the fatherless, protector of widows, is God in his holy habitation. God settles the, the solitary in a home. He, he leads out the prisoners to prosperity, but the rebellious dwell in a parched land. This is our God. Caring for the fatherless, bringing us into families, helping us to find our way. He's the one who does this, and this is what our church is all about. Helping formerly incarcerated people get back on their feet. The entire, there's, a, there's an entire book in the Bible that is about widows. Do you know this? About three widows. Anybody know what book it is? It's Ruth. Thank you very much. Ruth, Orpha, and Naomi. And, and it's all about God's love for the orphan, we see it in the New Testament, Acts 6, we looked at recently, where they had a whole ministry centered around caring for widows. We see it throughout. Clearly, Jesus was all about it. We see it in his brother, James, who says, you know what pure and undefiled religion is? Anybody, anybody know? You know what pure and uncontaminated religion is? Care for the orphan and for the widow. That's it. And do that, and you will prove that your heart's been transformed. It's not just about a ticket to heaven. This is showing God's love for us by the way we respond. So let's talk about the beauty of the church. I'm going to look at three beauties, okay? The beauty of family. We're going to look at the beauty, if you're taking notes, beauty of aging and the beauty of caring, all right? First of all, beauty of family. This is in uh, chapter five in verse one. Paul references four different groups in this one verse. Look at this, or two verses. Do not rebuke an older man, he says to Timothy, young Timothy, the pastor, but encourage him as you would a father, younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, and younger women as sisters in all purity. Do this all with a pure heart. He says, respect older men. Now, that's not to say, because he says elsewhere, that you don't rebuke them or correct them as a pastor. Uh, but instead, he says, hey, honor the elderly. Now, in Ephesus, certainly in Jewish culture, even a woman, a widow, was, as, as, uh, was to be honored. A mom was honored as much as a father. Um, we see this in, in, in the culture there in, in the Roman world. Just because of your age, you were honored. And we don't see as much of that these days. 
But in this culture, it really was the case. It's why last week we looked and he said, hey, Timothy, don't let anyone look down on you because you're young. See, the great equalizer, the leveler is Jesus Christ in the church, in the family. We all honor each other. Mutual submission, mutual admiration, mutual love. But he says, hey, especially lift up the older. And then he says, treat older women like your own mom. In the church, gang, everybody that you see, and even in this room, Everyone in this room and in the sanctuary and in the chapel, wherever we go, in our connect groups, in the hallway, out in the commons, after the service, every person you come across is like a brother or a sister. It's why the the primary image of the church is family. We're in this together. So we love each other. He says, love younger ones and, and, you know, as, as if they're your own. He would keep going. And this is especially poignant for Timothy, who was discipled by his mom and his grandmother. He saw the power of an intergenerational you know, experience. So we love, we protect, we honor every person, especially the most vulnerable. Widows and the youngest among us, the littlest ones. We're to care and to honor and bless them. And many of you can Many of you should be serving among our youngest ones. You should be serving in our ministries towards widows and others. We'll talk about that a bit today. You know, this is what I love about our church. Um, as a pastor, I get to see this cross-generational. And, and it, is, it is so fun. Just this week, and just, to, just to be encouraged. I, so last Sunday, I was with probably our oldest connect group, honoring one of our leaders. We had a lunch because he was going to have to step down to care for, for his wife. We're there celebrating. On Monday, the next day, I'm with our students, like for a few days here, here on campus. We had the gathering, and it was amazing. And I got to hear stories. I got to watch our adults disciple our students in so many ways. I saw um, Corey Hancock. Some of y'all might know Corey and Mills. Corey is an, an, a young um, accountant. He takes off a few days so that he can disciple, be with our younger students, uh, our, our teenagers, and disciple them. I saw a student get up, take the mic at one of our gatherings, and, and she was talking about how she's discipling her peers. And, and Morgan Womack tell, tells me she has like a train of disciples that she's discipling. This gal's in the ninth grade. How, how are you guys doing with that, by the way? I mean, that's why we're, we make disciples as disciples, right? How are you doing there? I'm inspired by that. Another gal got up, took the mic, and she talked, she's talking about how she, she serves in kids' worship on Sunday mornings. She's, in, she's encouraging all her, all her friends to join her because it's amazing. This is our church. This is the intergenerational church that we have, but everybody must do their part. What's your part? I was in a meeting last Sunday night, a vision kind of gathering, meeting with, with young leaders mostly. And, you know, we, and a lot of people are like, you know, gosh, it feels like 20% are doing like 80% of the work. I mean, we're, we've got so much to do. We've got, we need more people to step up. What are you, what is your ministry? How are you serving others? And some of you are being called out, even today, to serve those in need. I wonder who it is for you. What will it be? So, so this is the beauty of the church. The beauty of the church is that we are serving each other and we're united in Jesus. That's what's really cool. To be in a cross-generational church is we prove to the world. It's not about my style, my preference, my thing, my age. It's about Jesus. And that is countercultural. That is powerful. Secondly, look at this. Not just the beauty of, of, of family, but the beauty of aging. Again, super countercultural. Look at verse uh, three. Honor widows who are truly widows. Now, immediately you go, wait, truly widow? Like she's a widow. Who doesn't know who's a widow? Right? She's lost her husband. But this is actually a segment of culture, as, as we'll, we'll see here. And, and I just want to pause here. I give our, our church high marks here. But we've got a lot of widows who need care and those who, who we can reach out to and help. We have a ministry. In fact, it's going on right now. It's Grief Share. There's one online. It's on Zoom. There's another one that's in person. We have a helps ministry. It used to be called Manpower pre-COVID. We're looking to relaunch. We need those who will volunteer to help to say, you know, hey, I might, could periodically go and help widows who have issues at home or in their place. So I could just fix a you know, fix a leaky faucet or something. I could go help, do something just to be there to care for these widows. And you could, you could reach out to my office. You can reach out to Rodney Shell. 
uh, Keith Beasley, our chair of deacons, we want to help you get plugged in to serve. Our, especially those who are most vulnerable. So, so again, this is a segment of culture. And, and, and because in, in the first century, think about this, there was a, you'd get a dowry in, in marriage. A woman would receive financial help when she got married. And, and so then if she was not married then, right, widowed, she is at a financial disadvantage big time. So, so more than in our day today, they didn't have 401ks, they didn't have retirement accounts, they didn't have social security. They had none of that. So what does he mean by truly widows? He, well, he explains, verse four. But if a widow has children and grandchildren, let them first learn to show godliness to their own household and to make some return to their parents for this is pleasing in the sight of God. So don't miss this. Family is the first and primary source of help for the widow. And this is true for all of our families. When there's a need in the family, the family steps up first. I want to ask you, how are you doing there? I'm looking at faces, people I know. Many of you are caring for older parents. And some of you are, are I mean, just in this season where it is like a lot for you right now. And I just want to encourage you in that. That you are being the very hands and feet of God. He says you care for them. And friends, you will never regret caring for an older parent or a grandparent. Let me ask you, some of you young, young people, are you reaching out to your grandparents? Just to love them. Just let them know how, how much you, they mean to you. Reach out to them. We can love each other. That's what he's saying here. If they have family, family first. And look at what else he says. Why do we do it? We do it out of love. But you repay them. For what? Bringing you life. Right? Brought you into the world. Are you kidding me? He says there's, some, there's a payment that's coming back for return, he says. And, and so many of you are caring for parents and you're doing a great job. Here's the thing. Isaiah 46 verse 4. It says, even to your old age, in your gray hair, I will care for you. I will be with you. I will rescue you, he says. And he does this primarily through other family members. How are you doing with that? Are you caring for others who are in your family? As caregivers, you're reflecting the very heart of God. Then he moves into a section that's a little bit surprising, actually, where he then talks about, hey, let's qualify this. Let's vet this out. You know, and you're like, don't you just help everybody and all the widows? I mean, if they're widows, good grief. You know, let's help them, right? And clearly, there is that going on. But I've got to tell you this. We're making decisions like this all the time. Here's a principle applied. We're going to see in scripture. We're, I'm making decisions all the time. Our team is making decisions. Our missions team is making decisions all the time about where do we send our money? Where, where, what's, what's legitimate? Where's the legitimate source or need? How do you prioritize these things? I get asked, you might imagine, in our church. I'm at, I mean, requests come to my office all the time. Like this week, there will be a ministry, a pastor, somebody. I mean, now they're dropping into my DMs, right? It's like some guy in Africa. Hey, I understand. See, see your stuff. This is amazing. You got money? You know, and, and what do you do with that, right? I had a guy in my former church who showed up after church. He was talking away, dropping names, talking about all these pastor friends I had in the city. And he was talking all about what's going on. He was in scripture and all this kind of stuff. Had a little tie on. He's all about it. And, and, and I... I I don't know why he had a tie on, but uh, I mean, why I said that. He, he was dressed up. I'm saying he was playing the part is what I'm saying. He was like, I'm at church. And then I find out, he's, he, then, he, then he enters into this thing about how he's in financial help, needs help, financial need. And he's, he's sharing his story and he's down his luck. And he's, you know, and, but he's, he's naming all these pastors. I was a little skeptical, called a friend of mine, contacted another pastor. We started to realize this guy's going from church to church, each church, every church. He's going to all the churches and he's seeking money. This guy, we discover, we find out, he's like from Oklahoma City or somewhere, um, if you know him. Um, and he, he comes down and he's going from town to town, like city to city, taking advantage of God's people and the expected generosity among people in the church. So I say all that because what do you do with that? We certainly don't give money to people like that. But here's what can happen. This kind of greed and manipulation can take place even in the family. I see it in, you know, when we have, gosh, unfortunately, every now and then, funerals and whatnot, there's this discord. Friends, life is too short. But what do you do? When do you stand back, especially when money's involved? Well, Paul gives us some help. He says, provision first to the family, okay? 
Um, in verse 4, verse 8, verse 16, we see this. And then he, said, then he challenges widows. This is what's interesting. Look at verse 5. She who is truly a widow, left alone, has set her hope on God and continues in supplication and prayers night and day. But she who is self-indulgent is dead even while she lives. Whoa. I'm like, bro, you're talking to widows. Really? Yep. You can waste your life as a widow, as a widow, as an older person. He's saying that this is evidence, this kind of life, evidenced by a life of ongoing prayer. I see this all the time in our church. You wouldn't be surprised. The greatest prayer warriors among us are our widows. Praying for me, sending notes to me, probably to you. I mean, our senior adult group, they are caring for each other like nobody's business. It's amazing. Widows caring for widows. But notice, even in your old age, you can waste your life on self-indulgent living is what he's saying. There's a principle applied here. Don't support people, don't support ungodly lifestyle. This is what he's saying. Don't support, don't support those who aren't living like this. Now that's like, well, where's the grace, man? You know, right? I mean, if there's no family involved, yes, we're going to help. We're going to extend grace and we're going to call people to action and to love Jesus. But let me ask you, who in your life can you care for like this? Who is in your life? Every one of us has somebody in our lives. How can you be a part of this? Look at verse 7. Command these things. I mean, this is, this is he's telling young Timothy, command these people to do this. So that they may be without reproach. But if anyone does not provide for his own relatives, and especially for members of his own household, he has denied the faith, okay? You've denied even like you you pretend to live for Jesus because this is at the heart of God to do this. You've denied the faith, which is the whole Christian doctrine and experience we've talked about, just turning away from it altogether, and you're worse than an unbeliever. He's saying unbelievers take care of their family. And if you don't, you're worse than an unbeliever. And so I just challenge some of us. If you're not caring for people in your own family, this is the application. But we seek to to honor the aged. We seek to honor the elderly, and especially the widow and the widower. I read this from Oswald Chambers this week, one of my heroes. He, He writes this. Listen to this. Am I getting nobler, better, more helpful, more humble as I get older? Am I exhibiting the life that a person would take knowledge of as having been with Jesus? Or am I getting more self-assertive, more deliberately determined to have my own way? Listen, you can get older. You can get better. You can get bitter. I've seen it go both ways. You can grow more and more like Jesus and become this holy saint as a widow or widower or, or, or just an elderly single person off someday, or you can grow bitter, cold, and more angry and self-focused. And it's happening in your life right now. Show me your habits today. I'll tell you who you're becoming tomorrow. I can tell you what trajectory you are. Are you in his word? Are you committed to his church? Are you serving other people? Are you growing in prayer? And then Chambers asks, he says, he adds, adds this. It is a great thing to tell yourself the truth. What is true about you? Are you truly exhibiting the way of Jesus in the way that you live? Are you really doing it? So there's the beauty of family. There's the beauty of aging. And then there's the beauty of caring. We'll close here. And this is verse uh, verse 9. Let a widow be enrolled. This is interesting. There's a list. If she is not less than 60 years old. Now, this is really interesting as well, to actually name an age. Having been the wife of one husband and having a a reputation for for good works, if she has brought up children, has shown hospitality, has washed the feet of the saints, has cared for the afflicted, and has devoted herself to every good work. Now, that's quite a list. I'm reading that. I'm going, wow, I don't know if I've done that. You know, like who, 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 who can actually live up to this? He's saying, let her prove that she has been faithful to the Lord. She's lived for him. She's been faithful to a former husband. She's not like getting married, then another one, then another one. Instead, she's been faithful. So we see here, there's, this, there's the family test. Does she have family? There's a financial test. Okay, is there really need? And then now he says there's a faithfulness test. Has she been faithful? Look at verse 11. 
but refuse to enroll younger widows. Wait, what? For when their passions draw them away from Christ, they desire to marry and, and so incur, uh, incur the, the condemnation for having abandoned their former faith. Now he's saying, because he says this other places, um, he's not saying widows can't remarry. And we have some young, I mean, I, I know we have young even widows, maybe young single um, women or men in our church. And if you're one who is, is with that child, constant pressure of seeking to be a single parent, honoring the Lord, we honor you. We praise God for you. And we are here for you as family. But he's addressing two things. One is she's going to stay a widow. Like if you're, gonna, if you're not a widow, then you got help. But the other he's saying is don't let your need or desire to be cared for have you enter into an ungodly relationship. I mean, this is good for every single adult. Every young person, every person not married, don't go after someone simply because I want to be like I want to prove that I'm marriage worthy or because I don't want to be alone. He says, no, 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 no. That's going to cause you to go away from the faith. Pursue the Lord. He will care for you and he'll make those things happen if that's part of his will. Look at verse 13. Besides that, they learn to be idlers going about from house to house. He's calling these widows out. Not only idlers, but, but also gossips, busybodies. Saying what they shouldn't say. And they didn't even have telephones back then, right? He's like, did you hear? I mean, this is, this is the, and this is it. Like, there's the proverbial, right, gossip. Older woman talking about everything. Some of you are going, that's why I don't share with my grandmother what's happening. Because you're going to tell the whole family. But, but he says, don't do that. Because if you're not focused on others in prayer and seeking to help others, you're just, you're just talking about everybody else's life, right? This is the proverbial um, prayer request, Gossip is what it is. Did you hear that they're having trouble in their marriage? I saw it on the prayer list. We put, you know, and we're not putting that on our prayer list. But, but that, you know what happened? We, we, no, pray is what he says. Be praying for them. Don't be a busybody. Don't be a gossip. This is good for all of us. But then he says this. So I would have younger widows marry, bear children, manage their households, and give the adversary no occasion for slander. What he's saying here, I think, in a word, and I say this all the time to our widows, did a recent you know, funeral where I'm always saying to the widow, God is not finished with you yet. He's not done with you. And for all of us who've gone through loss and we've experienced you know, death within our families, maybe you're divorced, maybe you're going through a really hard scene, maybe you feel alone. God is not done with you. He's not finished with you. Look at verse 15. He says this, For some have already strayed after Satan. If any believing woman has relatives who are widows, let her care for them. He's saying, get busy serving others. Let the church not be burdened so that it may care for those who are truly widows. Here we see the beauty of the church in action. The beauty of family, the beauty of aging, and the beauty of of caring, and all of this so that we can show each other and show a watching world what our Savior is all about. The one who, while he was dying on the cross, looked down and saw his mother grieving, terrified, not only watching her own son die, but she was going to be left alone. And it was in the moment that God in Christ thought of us staying on the cross to die for our sin, he says to his mom, Mom, here's your son, John, my friend John. He's making sure his mom has a son. His mom has a family. He's taking care of his mom while he's dying. Friends, this is your God. This is our Savior. He's the one who has given his life for us. He's died to himself, and he is caring for you, and he's calling to you right now. To say, enter into the beauty of family, the beauty of aging, the beauty of caring. You come into my forever family. And you will live the most abundant life that you have been created to live. Friends, have you received his grace? Have you entered into the family? Are you a member of this local family? Is God calling you to do so? And now's the time. Today's the day. And so I want us to close in prayer. And, and I want us just to, yeah, would you bow your heads, just close your eyes. I want us to close in prayer as we end now, the, the, arguably the most important moment of the day, as we say, okay, how will you apply 
this message. Some of you, you need to receive Jesus. Like many of our students have done this week, to say yes to him. Maybe you can't remember a moment in time or when you received his grace. He has died on the cross for you. He gives his life for you so that you could be set free from your sin. He took on your punishment so that you wouldn't have to. So that on the day when you stand before God Almighty on judgment day, do you know that you know that you have received his grace, that you're going to be able to say, yes, I have received Jesus, my only hope for salvation. Friend, if you've never done that right now, it could be your day just to say, yes, Lord, I give you my life. I settled this once and for all. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. I give you my life in response. Now help me, starting today, to become the person you've called me to be. And, and others of you, listen, you need to join the church today. Now just say, Lord, I am going to be a part of your family, this great family on earth as it is in heaven. Today is the day. And now others, think about it. I want you to apply, talk about it. How will you apply this message? Who's in your life? A widow, a widower, an elderly person, a parent, grandparent. Who is in your life? A neighbor, a coworker that you can serve and help. Go after them this week. Lord, we pray that we'll be the church you've called us to be and the world will see the beauty of Jesus through us. In your name we pray, amen, amen.